This is Demetrius Spinrad. And this is Isaac Meyer. And you're listening to Criminal Records Podcast, a podcast about some of the weirdest cases in true crime history. And we are continuing our weird case of James Revis, a.k.a. the Baron of Arizona, brought to you by the excellent audio quality of Isaac getting his first cold of the year. Common yes. peril of being a history teacher. <laughs> Yes, my children have given me my first gift to take home, which is apparently a cold. Or is it, I was going to be fancy and try to remember what type of virus a cold is technically, but is the rhinovirus? Is that right? I don't know. I don't teach biology. Yeah, we don't run this podcast because we know how biology works. Uh, anyway, so hopefully still yeah. will be better audio quality than last week when I screwed up my noise gate so bad that part of my audio was completely inaudible. So... It's time for a sentence I never thought I'd say, Demetria. Let's go back to Arizona. <laughs> so last time we recorded, I told you the story of James Revis's rise from a humble scammer of the Confederate Army, a cause we greatly support. We don't support the Confederate Army, but we greatly do support scamming from the Confederate Army. Uh, so he started with those humble beginnings and he rose all the way to selling quit claim deeds on land that he didn't own in Arizona, thanks to a very unusual quirk of the way the treaties ending the Mexican-American War and a later treaty uh, buying some extra land from Mexico worked. So basically what he was doing was using forged documents that he claimed were from the Spanish government to say that he had a claim to land in America that America had to honor. So this is what he's doing. Now, now is the part where shit gets crazy. All that money, those hundreds of thousands he scammed in part one, you ain't seen nothing yet, sir. I mean, that is a pretty audacious scam that also, I mean, really appeals to me because of the level of nerdery you have to attain about like treaty law to do it. So I'm excited for whatever it is, is a step above and beyond that. So James Revis has a problem. He has, I mean, he solved his money problem. He's got lots of cash flowing in, but he's created a new problem for himself which is that he's done a very good job of forging the history of this Peralta family that was uh, supposedly granted the right to this very, very large swath of land in a very profitable part of Arizona by the Spanish monarchy. The problem is, even though he has some Spanish ancestry himself, it's going to look suspicious now if he starts claiming that he is the heir to the Peralta family. He's what he has been doing up to this point is saying that he bought the rights to this land from a widow who was the who was married to his shady sort of business partner Dr. Willing. So that was what he was claiming was his claim to the land. The problem is that's that's something that can be called into question. Um, and Dr. Willing's claim to the land is itself in question because Dr. Willing did not really do a good job of documenting his purchase of the original documents, which ended up being completely worthless very well. Uh, so James Revis knows he, he's done a really good job of establishing that this completely false claim to the land is real, but now he has to establish that he is the one with the claim to the land. So this is where Revis comes up with a brilliant idea. Why not invent a real heir to the land or a real heiress and then marry that heiress? Huh. Wait, so the idea is to forge a genealogy of a totally separate person, mm -hmm. establish like that establishes the legitimacy of their claim. And I guess because it's a forgery, you have a free, you know, you can you have some time freedom to set things up where he's already kind of a known quantity. That, that, that's a little tricky. Yeah, I see it. I see it. OK. Yeah. So there is one problem, which is that Revis is actually still married to someone who is definitely not the heir to any land in Arizona when he comes oh, yeah, up that, with uh, this. That would be tricky. Yes. Yeah, his first wife, Ada Pope, doesn't file for divorce until 1883. Uh, she does that because he essentially did desert her when he decides to go up chasing this Arizona land claim. Uh, so 
He actually has some overlap between his marriage to the heiress that he invents and Miss Ada Pope, and that will cause some potential problems later. I mean, I gotta say, you know, seems like a great con artist. I do not get a lot of responsible husband vibes from this guy, so that tracks. So for about a year, uh, Rivas more or less disappears from public view. He has a lot of work to do behind the scenes, fabricating not only more of the Peralta story, but the story of how the heir to the family ended up not being in possession of these documents and yet is still the legitimate heir. So he invents a woman named Carmelita. The fictional Carmelita has a life story In the classical Spanish romantic fashion, she has a wastrel grandfather who is the one who sells away these land documents on the cheap, a dashing but debauched father. Uh, The other members of her family, including her mother and twin brother, conveniently fall sick and die when Carmelita is just an infant. Uh, This is a convenient fiction by Rivas so that he doesn't have to produce an entire extended family for her. He can just show up with this woman and say, oh, I just discovered her and she didn't even realize that she was the heir. She was just growing up as an orphan somewhere and I just plucked her out of obscurity. A strong, tragic backstory, great way to establish a character. Gives gives her an arc, some room for growth. So yeah, this is a great character, but he needs an actual person to be this character. And we actually don't know very much at all about the woman who becomes his real Carmelita. She continued to maintain through the rest of her life that she actually was Carmelita and that Rivas had met her by chance on a train all the way back in 1877. And it just happened to mention how similar she looked to the esteemed Peralta family. And isn't it strange that she, what if she could possibly be the heir? She did continue to maintain that they married in secret before his divorce with Ada Pope was official. So a lot going on with that timeline. She's just very method. She's just very, very immersed in the role. I I mean, as method actors go, this woman is one of the greats. I mean, she is she is really going to do some stuff. You got to commit to the bit. And it seems like she's committed to the bit. In reality, the real Carmelita probably was a very young woman in a very difficult situation. She may have been born to an indigenous mother out of wedlock and possibly either given away by her mother or functionally sold into servitude as a child. So she wasn't what we would call a chattel slave, but she was her her status as a free woman was kind of iffy. Um, reinventing herself as a noble heiress and getting married to a wealthy man who would do things like send her off to a convent school to learn fancy manners probably seemed like the best way out of a hard life that did not leave her with a bunch of good options. If it is true that the couple first met in the 1870s, and there's a very good chance that wasn't true, but if it was, she probably would have been a teenager working at a dead end and quite possibly very exploitative, if not actually illegal job. So while I would say I do have a bad habit of leaning a little too far on the side of admiring con artists in this podcast... I certainly cannot fault Carmelita for using Rivas as a ticket to a better life. I can't even fault her if she really did buy into the story that she was Spanish nobility. It is very possible that Rivas told her this story and told her that she was Spanish nobility. And she was like, you know what? Nothing worse can happen to me if I believe this guy. So I'm just going to go for it. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a nice way to live your life. I mean, even if you don't believe it, it's a. It would be a much a much more, I guess. It opens some doors that would otherwise not be not be open to you. So for Carmelita, Rivas has to go back to the drawing board or the forging board and create some new documents. He makes a deed from her grandfather confirming that she is the sole heir to the Peralta land in Arizona and New Mexico. So that's solving the problem of who really is the actual rightful owner of these documents. It's Carmelita now. But he not only creates that document, he has to create records of her birth, confirming the story about the mysterious Spanish woman 
who gives birth to twins and then dies and then the other twin dies. So to create that document, he finds a friendly rector in San Bernardino and he talks that rector into lending him the old baptism and burial records of the parish. So he takes those records away, he rips a page out, and he ends up creating a new forged page in which two, uh, two actual real people who had been born the year of Carmelita's birth are erased, and Carmelita and her fake brother are added instead to the birth record. And then he retur- he helpfully returns this parish record. So when people go searching later, he doesn't even need to produce the documents. He could just say, go to this church and they will find the documents already there. That is very clever. I got to give it to him. But this is actually not all that clever in the end. This is one of Rivas's mistakes that will eventually be his undoing. What he doesn't know when he forges and returns the register is that the parish keeps a separate index ledger of names that are in the register. So when things start falling apart and they are going to fall apart spectacularly and the Secret Service has to dig into the Riva story, they might be limited in their ability to check centuries old documents held by other governments. Although, man, do they they go above and beyond looking for those documents it it becomes a bit of an international incident, really. But the Secret Service does have access to this birth record, and they do pick up on the disparity between the birth record that's in the ledger and the birth record that is in the index. Undone by bureaucracy. But there's even more that Rivas has to do. He decides that he is going to fake some archaeological evidence as well. So when Spanish groups would be exploring in the American Southwest, they would often leave a carving of just sort of on whatever stone they happened to discover, just to, you know, sort of mark where they had been. And so he fakes one of these carvings. He goes into the area that he is claiming and he carves a stone, but he doesn't just carve the stone because if it's a brand new looking stone carving, it's clearly going to be a fake. So... After he carves the stone, he takes a file and he he files down the edges to make it look weathered, and then he stains it with vegetable juice so it'll look like it's been sitting out in the in the hot sun exposed to the elements for a while. So then later he can rediscover this archaeological evidence of the Peralta exp- expedition. I mean, once again, a solid plan, clearly laid, laying some good contingencies here. Uh, trying to kind of disguise his hands and all of it. I, I see. I see the strategy. So now Rivas's story is that Carmelita is the real heir, but also because he he still has to make sure that this is consistent with his original story. So her grandfather did meet Doctor Willing at some point and did sell him the land grant, which Doctor Willing's widow in turn signed away to Rivas. So either way, as the husband of Carmelita or as the guy who got Mrs. Willing to sign some papers, Rivas has established that he is the guy who rightfully owns the Peralta land grant. He's getting it from from both sides. I mean, that's very convenient for him. And I'm just I'm very happy that all worked out for him, you know, in this very kind of tidy way. I have no question. It seems legit to me. Isaac, I don't think this is enough. I don't think he's gone far enough yet. I think he needs to go further. Are you sure? I mean, it's just Arizona. I think he needs to go to Spain and find some actual real Peraltas to be the family of Carmelita. What, like just club him over the head and stuff him in a trunk? And well, let him not be little, like, welcome to the wedding. He's a little more subtle than that. But he needs to establish that Carmelita does have those aristocratic ties back in Spain. So in the summer of 1855... He claims that he is setting sail for Spain to search for the records of the Peralta family in Madrid. And the couple does set off, but before they set sail for Spain, they have to stop off in New York. And it is true, New York is on the way to Spain if you are going by boat, but it is also a great place to network with tycoons who are very interested in the silver mining rights on Peralta land. So, to raise some money for the Spanish trip, he scams some more rich men out of a few more tens of thousands of dollars. And then, Mr. and Mrs. Rivas 
have more than enough money to travel in Spain in true aristocratic style. Man, why didn't we think of that to finance our trips? I know. I I feel like we are really bad at claiming to have any sort of noble ancestry. We're very much of peasant stock. We should have aimed higher. Yeah, I mean, if there's one thing if there's one thing I've learned from this guy, it's that all that matters is if you believe what you're saying hard enough. Also, you forge a lot of documents. So traveling in style is itself a really important part of the con. If he shows up looking like some random clerk from California, he's not going to be taken seriously. But if he shows up in Europe seeming like he's already a wealthy and influential man, he has a chance of charming the Spanish nobility. The thing is... Even though it's been a couple hundred years, the Spanish are still kind of smarting about losing so much territory to America. And now here comes Rivas, who is part of Spanish descent himself, claiming that he is married to a Spanish heiress. And he's showing up with this legal document that all everything in his legal argument is hinging on this Spanish land grant. It really feels like a way for the Spanish aristocrats and politicians to stick it to the Yankees. And and it's a great investment opportunity for them, too. I mean, I can see resenting, uh, you know, losing that much territory. And also, I mean, not a great time for Spanish-American relations in general right now. The Spanish-American War is just a couple of years down the pipe, if memory serves. So Yeah, there's... There's a lot of reasons why it seems like it would be a good idea to be on the good side of an American businessman who is claiming that he owns a big chunk of American territory and is cozying up to Spanish interests. But you might be asking yourself, wouldn't the Spanish of all people be able to check whether the Peralta family was actually real? I mean, that would make sense. The problem is that Spanish family trees by this point don't make a lot of sense to the casual observer, at least among the aristocracy. The intermarriages of all of these noble families over the course of hundreds and hundreds of years is so complicated and so tangled. Even the Spanish consul in San Francisco totally buys this Peralta story when when Rivas presents it to him. It certainly sounds real, and even even families who go by the name Peralta, families who have their own documents of their own families, are kind of like looking at each other going, is this one of ours? I, I don't know. I mean, that's that. I guess that makes sense, right? Because some of those aristocratic trees get very, very tangled, I know, with the uh, the way that like family intermarriage works in Spain. Right, where it's not purely patrilineal, which makes things even more confusing than they already are with any kind of, like, aristocratic family tree. Yeah, if if inheritance was purely patrilineal, it might have caused some issues with Car- I, with Carmelita being able to inherit land. I I think some of his fake, fake inheritance passed through some women along the way. But Rivas shoots his shot, and he writes to a bunch of different families named Peralta of sufficiently high standing, saying, Hi, I think I found and married your lost relative. And one of them takes the bait. Okay, so who are they? Are they just desperate for the spotlight? They just really need someone to fill up the family reunion? So a man named General Carlos Ibera believes that he is a blood relative of Carmelita. He believes the story that Rivas is telling. And he not only believes this, but he generously invites the pair to stay in his home. What a nice man. He's just lonely, I guess. So long before the days of 23 and Me, James Rivas just reaches out out of nowhere going, I think I found your long lost relative. And this guy is like, checks out. I don't know who's in my family. I'm sure he just wanted someone to hang out with. And the reason that Rivas has been writing to these Spanish noble families is because he wants to network. He wants to work his way into the upper, upper part of the upper crust. And it works. General Ibarra makes connections. He talks about his newfound, long-lost relative. And, oh, isn't it wonderful? She's married to this rich man and they have all of this land. Isn't it wonderful? And really gets the really gets the upper crust buzzing 
And these two cause such a sensation that they get invited to the Spanish palace. Not only do they get invited to the Spanish palace, but Queen Maria Cristina herself acknowledges them publicly and requests a private audience with Carmelita because she is intrigued by this story. Ooh, I mean, I, I guess you have to give it this. No one would ever be crazy enough to make something like this up, right? So obviously it has to be true. And Carmelita is, by all accounts, an incredibly charming woman and amazingly beautiful woman. She's considered one of the great beauties, a thing that will, uh, a little bit later in the story, lead to some creepy results. Uh, but she is completely charming the Spanish court by telling all these crazy stories about the American Wild West. And Europeans are just fascinated by stories about the Wild West. Rivas uses these connections to the queen herself to move in the very, very top of the upper crust. He is collecting massive amounts of money and gifts. The nobles are just showering him with gifts. Like he'll admire something that, uh, that they own and they'll be like, oh, just take it. It's yours. We love you so much. While all of this is happening, he is also earning an estimated $100,000 a year from his ongoing grift back in the United States. So he is raking it in. He is living very well. He buys and furnishes a mansion in Madrid so that he can show off his status and, and he can really move among the nobility as one of them. But... While he's doing all this, he is still hard at work forging the Peralta story because he needs a few extra documents to prove Carmelita's legitimacy. And he needs something that he cannot forge himself with his limited artistic skills. He needs some paintings. Why? Pa like family portraits? Yes, he is going to need portraits of the fictional Peralta family to take back to America with him. Fortunately, it is not hard at all to find cheap portraits of Spanish nobles because there are a lot of Spanish kind of minor noble families who don't really want art of their great great grandfather cluttering up their house. So he goes around to a bunch of flea markets in Madrid and he picks up real paintings of real Spanish nobles that he can pass off as the Peraltas. Wait, so he did the equivalent of just like going to Goodwill to like grab some random photos from the frames people drop off? Yep, that is exactly what he did. Well, I mean, I guess reduce, reuse, recycle, right? I figured he was going to actually pay someone to make fake, fake portraits for him. No, this guy upcycled an entire family. You know what? That's probably more economical. So nicely done, you know? Good business sense. But Revis's shadiness with old items gets him in trouble again. In an archive in Seville, he tries to walk off with some documents that he can doctor, just like he did in Mexico. A clerk spots him doing this and confronts him, and the police are called. He is successfully able to use his very, very esteemed connections to squash an investigation, but it's time for him to get out of the country. It is time for him to move on to greener, scamming pastures. So back to Arizona now, then? Oh, no. Oh, no, sir. First, he goes to London. Why London? What's there? Well, what's in London is a lot of fucking money. Thanks to letters of introduction from the nobles who believed him back in Spain, Rivas is able to score a reception at Buckingham Palace. And if you get a reception at Buckingham Palace with Queen Victoria herself, doors start opening for you in England. Wow. I mean, just continuing, I guess, to build on the grift of no one would be crazy enough to fake this, so it must be above board. And if you're going to grift a family in England, you can't do better than the Rothschilds. He oh manages to get into the inner circle of the Rothschild family. So the Rothschilds of, uh, should we talk about who the Rothschilds are? I mean, probably. People have seen enough weird <laughs> memes about them on the internet at this point. 
Yes, they are an incredibly wealthy European banking family, um, also the subject of many, many conspiracy theories because they are Jewish. Some of their members have behaved poorly, but not for any secret protocols of the elders of Zion reasons, uh, but they, they were and continue to be incredibly wealthy. I think they're a little bit less dominant as a force of political power than they were in the 1800s, but still doing pretty well for themselves. Yeah, they were one of very few families that did pretty well out of Jewish emancipation in England um, and with some existing kind of banking positions then kind of cleaned up and became very wealthy and influential in the UK. Uh, and it's really annoying because they are often, again, the subject of weird anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. Uh, and so I feel like obligated to kind of step in and be like, well, they're not evil, but also they're bankers. So like they suck for that reason. Like I, w I want to be able to dislike them for the legitimate reasons that are OK. To, it's OK to dislike them for but I just have to always be on guard. Okay, I, I'll give you a legitimate reason to dislike Alfred Rothschild. Because Alfred Rothschild is a very close friend of the Prince of Wales at the time. And the Prince of Wales at the time is quite a character. He's a very, very strange prankster who loves playing bizarre pranks on his friends, like feeding them soap and telling them it's cheese. He also likes to do things that he calls adoration parties, where he invites beautiful women to parties where men publicly adore them. And he wants Mrs. Revis to be the subject of one of these adoration parties. All I'm saying is the French had the right idea. So this is how the Revises get in good with the Rothschilds and the Prince of Wales himself, by trading on Carmelita's beauty. And it works. In addition to this, uh, Baron Rothschild is genuinely excited to meet a man who he believes to be well-connected in the American railroad industry. And remember, Brevis is claiming that he owns this very, very crucial stretch of land that is going to be used for railroads in Arizona. So making friends with this guy is, I, I mean, his wife is very beautiful, but it's about more than his wife's beauty. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's a what it's a what a work in, or business and pleasure vacation. Yeah. Mhm. Mm and the business works out very well for the Revises because they are in England in 1887 and that is the year of the golden jubilee of Queen Victoria. So royals and their retinues are traveling from all over the world to London. So Revis gets the chance to tell his story not just to the Queen of England, but to some of the most influential people on the planet. I mean, I get it. I guess at this point they'll just believe him, right? Because he's had other people vouch for him, so he must be above board. Yeah, things are going great for Revis. He is in the social circles of a truly extraordinary number of monarchs who just love these stories about the Wild West. They have a large and steady income from rent on the land that Revis is claiming to own. Things are looking great, but then Revis gets a cable about a new lawsuit. Remember Dr. Willing, that weird con artist that Revis maybe a little bit stole the original land grant paperwork from? Dr. Willing's widow had signed the rights away to to Revis in exchange for money after he started profiting from the land, which he didn't pay her, by the way. Of <laughs> he course. never actually paid her the money he promised her. But Dr. Willing's father is a bit of a con artist himself. And now the elder Willing is filing a lawsuit against Revis, arguing that the Peralta land belongs to the Willing family. So he is arguing that Dr. Willing's will only entitled his wife to a life estate, meaning she only had the rights to profit off that land during her lifetime. She didn't have the ability to sign it away to somebody else. The problem is, Revis's faked documents are too good. The actual documents that he got from Dr. Willing, they were worthless. They were for what's called the floating land grant. Those things kind of got sold as novelties for a couple dollars because they were a cool old document, but you couldn't actually use them to claim any land from the government. 
The paperwork he forged, though, the paperwork that he claimed came from Dr. Willing, that is what is worth a lot of money. So Willing Sr. saw how rich Revis was getting, and he decides that he is going to do exactly what he did. He starts his own competing operation, also selling quitclaim deeds on the same land, because he is now arguing that he is the rightful owner of the land that Revis is claiming he is the rightful owner of, which neither of them actually own. Which then, I guess, raises, you have to actually resolve it in court, which is where all of this starts coming under serious scrutiny. Am, am, I, am I following? Yes. And remember, neither of these people have actually officially managed to register their claim with the U.S. government yet. Selling quit claim deeds does not require you to prove that you own the land. You know, that seems like a bit of a legal oversight. I mean, that that is how quit claim deeds work. They're just designed to be very, very quick to transfer. So if you're gifting land or something, they they don't require going through all of the documentation, but they are very abusable, like if you have a situation like this. So Mary Ann Willing, Dr. Willing's wife, who has still not been paid, finally wises up to the fact that Revis is making a lot of money on this land and he still owes her like $30,000. So she also starts asking like, where's my money? Can I have the money that you owe me? And I'm sure he like, so I'm guessing now things are even more complicated, right? Because there's two different kind of claims that have to be fended off while defending the legitimacy of his whole elaborate scheme. Yes. And because this lawsuit is bringing some more attention to the question of who actually owns the land, th those anti-Revis campaigns that had been happening in Arizona that kind of died down a bit after he just left, those start springing back to life. Uh, they're the campaign to prove once and for all that he really doesn't own this land is getting a lot more serious. So he has to return to America and sort all this out. So problem number one, Dr. Willing's father. In the case of con artist v. con artist, Revis wins very easily. That is not a hard claim to prove. He whips out as evidence that he owns this land, not only all of the documents he forged, but the fact that his own wife is the, the heiress of this land. And this is the first time that he gets the chance to display all of those portraits of Spanish nobles in court. So he actually has those as evidence saying, look at all of her ancestors. Don't they look very Spanish? Ergo, she is their descendant. I mean, makes perfect sense to me. She's Spanish. They're Spanish. Tracks. Absolutely tracks. And he pays a little bit of money to Mrs. Willing, um, not nearly as much as she deserved, but he gives her just enough to shut her up for a little while. So problem solved. But after spending years overseas being treated like a baron, Revis has developed some ambitions beyond his original quick claim deed selling scam. He is realizing if you have all of this land, there is a lot more you can sell on it than quit claim deeds. You can start land development companies and rake in the really, really big bucks by selling shares in them. So what he's doing is he starts, he starts a mess of companies, like a whole bunch of companies that he claims are focused on improving the land he owns in Arizona. And this is land that has a ton of minerals on it, and it is land that has uh, some of the most important rivers in the area on it. So he's claiming that he's going to build all of this irrigation, and he's going to build all of these mines. And if you just buy a share in the companies now, you're going to get paid back so many times over because he's going to invest all of that money into improving the land. So those companies start selling shares at $100 a pop. That's big money for the period, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a lot of money. Should we do our should we do our conversion rate calculator again? Oh, sure. Is this 1887? 1887. All right, random internet search says immediately that's about $3200. 
for a mere $3,200 you too can help Revis improve the land of Arizona. And basically pocket change. I mean, when you really think about the rich rate on return you're going to get there. So selling these shares is how the vast majority of his income over the course of the scam ends up uh, coming in. So like we said, in the early days of the scam, he was making about $100,000 a year. He later, he much, much later estimates that what he takes in over the entire course of this con is $5,300,000. And that's not adjusted again, right? Yes, that is not adjusted. That is unadjusted, uh, I would say, late 1880s or 90s income. That's a lot of money. That's several tens of millions of dollars, I think. That is a tremendous amount of money. Less, still less, because remember he was claiming that he would let the government buy this land off him for a couple hundred million. So less than he at least claimed this land was worth, but a hell of a lot of money. A real enterprising man of business. Some of America's most esteemed businessmen buy into these companies because Revis makes such huge promises about building dams irrigating the desert to turn it into farmland, and building mines to take advantage of those mineral deposits. The ironic thing, actually, is if he had actually owned the land and done all those things, it actually really would have been worth what he was claiming it was worth. Um, some of those rivers later were dammed and created a ton of farmland in Arizona that is, to this day, still incredibly valuable. He was right about what you needed to do to improve the land. He just wasn't right about owning it. You know, it really seems like he could have done much better for himself just going into a legitimate field of business and kind of cleaning up that way. I but mean, I guess there's no fun that. in that. It didn't work yeah. out. Yeah. When he was gambling with his own real money, it didn't work out well for him. I think it was it was money that wasn't his that allowed him to take the really big risks. Ah, uh, yes. That's the real secret. So now to back up the fact that he owns all of these land improvement companies and to continue selling people on the fact that he really is improving this land, he has to return to Arizona with his wife and they have to go on a sort of media blitz tour. He takes his wife around Arizona and he takes photographs of her. And specifically, he makes sure to take a photograph of his wife wearing this family crest of the Peraltas in front of the marking stone that he had carved as proof that the Spanish expedition had discovered and claimed the land. And then he sends this off to papers because he really has to make sure the media believes that he has a valid claim to this land. Because like I said, Rivas has not secured this claim under the law. Yes, he defended himself in civil court, but the purpose of that civil lawsuit was not to determine who was the valid owner of the land. It was to determine whether the transfer of documents was valid. The surveyor general has to make a determination about whether the Peralta land grant is real. And of course, while Rivas was away in Europe meeting various queens, the folks who were living on this land in Arizona have gotten pretty angry at him, and they have had some time to organize. Yeah, I mean, that is kind of, that scam only lasts for so long. And uh, he made a pretty early misstep where he basically, he sort of used a threat of of rent and then offering to drop the rent to bribe it, someone who owned a newspaper. And when that came out, everyone else who owned a newspaper kind of got up in arms and allied against him. So the media hates this guy. They really hate Revis. Even papers outside the land he has claimed are printing what are pretty close to outright threats of violence against him. Instead of staying in the area around the city of Phoenix that he is claiming and possibly getting murdered there, he heads to Mexico, where the locals are willing to treat him like a baron if he spreads some of his ill-gotten gains around. He continues to not pay Mary Ann Willing, 
because now that he has used the fact that he is married to Carmelita in court to say that, oh, now my claim comes through the actual heir of this land, uh, she, I mean, it's pretty obvious that he's going to challenge this original agreement he signed. He does generously, oh so generously, give her $600. Remember that he promised her $30,000. I mean, that's just, that's just mean at that point. But he knows that the question of Carmelita's heritage is ultimately going to be a huge part of what might decide any eventual court case about this land in his favor. So he starts bribing some people who knew Carmelita as a child to make sure that they stick with the version of the story that he created about the woman who dies shortly after birth with a set of twins and gives this twin gives the remaining child up uh, with some vague story about how she might come into money someday. He makes sure that they stick with that story and not the like uh, some indigenous woman just showed up with a child that she couldn't care for or whatever. Uh, that's not going to be a story that wins Carmelita any favors. And it seems for a while like he's actually going to pull this off. He is doing a pretty good job of faking the Carmelita story. But then he runs into a spell of bad luck because one of his most vigorous defenders was Senator Roscoe Conklin. He had been championing his claim for quite a while, but he dies in April 1888. And Arizona's surveyor general, John Heese, uh, gets dismissed, and he leaves a bunch of notes for his successor. And those notes are some pretty damning documentation of suspicions about the Peralta land grant, of Revis's shady behavior and attempts to bribe him. And his successor, who is a man named Royal A. Johnson, picks up these notes and goes, oh, whoa, something is going on here. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's not a great start to that relationship. So Johnson finishes the report of all the questionable business going on with this, and he sends it to Washington in October 1889. And this is a report unanimously declaring that the Peralta land grant is fraudulent. James Rivas should get nothing. He points out some pretty convincing reasons to believe this uh, based on the papers that he was shown and that his uh, and that the surveyor general before him was shown. Should I should I read off a few of Revis's mistakes? Because up until this point, I portrayed him as kind of a genius forger. Uh, let's let's poke a couple holes in that story. Uh, you know, I don't think you need to because a bunch of Spanish nobles thought he was legitimate. And also the Prince of Wales thinks his wife is hot. And that's all I need. So the, the Spanish nobility might be pretty easily fooled, but they also have not seen a lot of these documents, and they might raise some questions if they had seen this. Because the title sheet of the grant that the surveyor general had been shown looked like it had been torn apart and pasted back together. The name Peralta only occurred on one of those torn strips. So basically what he did was he ripped up the title sheet. He took off part of the middle of it. He just writes the name on there, and then he tapes it back together. You know, so he basically did the equivalent of the, like, weird murder letter where you, like, you're clipping out letters to make your little, your little, like, ransom note. Yeah, he, yeah. he did make it look more authentic than that. He made it look like a document that had been damaged at some point and patched back together, but it was pretty obvious that the name Peralta had been inserted. Yeah, that's not, that's not great. And you said there's more? There's more. So some of the writing, if you look at it very closely, does not look like it had been done with a quill, which it should have been done with. It looks like it's been done with a steel pen, which wasn't in common use at the time. That's just lazy. That's just bad forgery. Oh, it gets worse. So for some of these printed documents, when the surveyor general looks at them, he goes, oh, something's kind of weird about this. So he takes it to a guy who is an expert on typography and says, is something kind of weird about the print on these documents? So this guy looks at it and goes, oh, I recognize this font because it is not the kind of typeface that would have been used in Spain at the time. 
What it actually is, is an, a really ornate, squiggly, gothic-inspired font uh, that was really popular in the 1880s because you would use it to sort of get that romantic old world look in a printed document. It is not the kind of typeface that a Spanish bureaucrat would choose to print up legal documents in the 1770s. So Rivas just chose a typeface and goes, oh, that looks old timey. I'll use that. I mean, OK, that's bad. That's pretty bad. Yeah, it's pretty bad. And it gets worse because it turns out that when they get someone who can actually read Spanish to look at these documents, uh, there are some very basic spelling errors. All of these supposedly high ranking Spanish bureaucrats who drew those up had some trouble spelling extremely basic words in Spanish. I mean, that's amazing. You go in there with like a middle school level of Spanish and be like, no, nah, I can do this. Yeah, that's about that's about the level that he went with there. Uh, the jig certainly seems like it's up. Now this document is out there. The U.S. government has their hands on it. It actually ends up being published uh, for public consumption and circulated quite a bit. But does Rivas back down? He does not. What he does is he sues the U.S. government for $11 million. He is arguing that the government has sold and reserved for government purposes land that does not belong to them and stolen water from the Gila River for irrigation that is supposed to belong to James Rivas through this Peralta grant. I mean, I guess that's one approach, but I, I don't think you're going to manage to scare the U.S. government into backing down. They have a few more resources than he does. Well, James Rivas has some pretty good resources of his own. He actually has some of the, at the time, most esteemed lawyers in the country on his side, and they're the ones who tell him to sue. This is where he really makes his fatal error. The story he cooked up is so elaborate and so hard to prove if you don't understand some of the vagaries of the way really old Spanish documents work that his own lawyers believe his story. He has not let them in on the con. So they are giving him advice on the assumption that the Peralta family claim is real and that Rivas really did locate and marry its heiress. They were never really considering the possibility that his fraud would be discovered in court because they didn't even know that fraud was taking place. Uh, as a matter of fact, one of the lawyers who is advising him is a very, very famous attorney who is also investing in his business and oh, is also buddy. very famous for losing massive amounts of money oh, in various buddy. investments. I mean, that does track with what I know of lawyers who often think they are very smart, but it's a very narrow field. So when you see the government for a sum of money that large, and I already did the calculations on this one, this is about $350 million in today's money. You are inviting some very close scrutiny of your claims. And the U.S. government has made some changes to the way it handles land grant claims since Rivas first started this scheme all the way back in the 1870s. Rivas had actually been in favor of a court of private land claims, which the government established in 1891 specifically to deal with these lingering issues with Spanish, Mexican, and French land grants because there were people who had valid claims to land that had originally not belonged to America and had kind of been passed over to America, and there needed to be a more formalized process of investigating them. Rivas thought that this court would be an easy venue for him to make his claim 100% official and start, uh, I don't, I don't know what his end goal was. Cause I don't know if he actually would have developed all of the land he claimed he would have developed or if he would have just scammed even more money and disappeared into the night. But he seemed to, by this point, believe that he could genuinely 100% legally establish this claim. I mean, I guess, uh, you know, got to respect Eamon High, but I'm, I'm imagining the U.S. government's not just going to roll over on this one. They do not. The chief justice of this new court appoints a special attorney named Matthew Reynolds to dig into the Peralta case. 
So Reynolds is not an expert on Spanish law, but he does find another attorney who specializes in Mexican and Spanish law, and he also gets to borrow two special agents from the Secret Service of the Treasury Department. And this team really puts the legwork in. They travel across the country. They scrutinize all of the documents that Rivas claims backs up his story. They start interviewing people who are important to backing up Rivas' story about his wife's family and the existence of the Peralta Barons. So all those people who Rivas was traveling around bribing, they find them. They start to poke some holes in those stories. And they actually send their expert on Spanish law to Mexico and to Spain to investigate the archives where Rivas claims that he made his big discoveries. And I'm guessing that with uh, those investigations, the whole kind of house of cards comes down pretty quickly. This is where it starts to crumble. Remember that archivist in Seville who caught Rivas trying to walk off with some documents? He is very happy to tell his story to the American government. Yeah, if there's one thing I know, it's don't piss off librarians. They hold a grudge. Oh, yeah. He has a particular grudge because Rivas had been pretty shady. He showed up looking for documents no one in this archive had ever heard of and goes, oh, oh, it must just be your organization. Let me look around for them. And then he conveniently discovers in this archive documents that nobody in the archive have ever heard of. And then after doing that was when he got caught trying to sneak files out of the archive. And it turns out that while Rivas wasn't quite so stupid as to do the forging in the archive himself, he did have a bad habit of leaving his forging tools out in front of his landlady and his landlady ends up speaking to this lawyer and going, yeah, it was really weird that he was, I had no idea what he was doing this whole time, but he was just leaving out all these like old documents and ink and pens and he was working on them all the time. I don't know what he was doing. I mean, that sounds like she knew exactly what she was doing and maybe, uh, maybe just one too many tenant complaints, you know? So Remus is getting pretty nervous. He takes a trip to Mexico just to make sure that he can conveniently discover a couple of extra documents to try to support his story. He also has to spend a good deal of his resources traveling around the country to collect affidavits from people who are willing to swear that they personally knew the made-up baron. So the, the man that he's claiming was Carmelita's grandfather he now not only needs people who claim that they knew Carmelita as a child, he needs people who claim that they knew his gran her grandfather. The two Secret Service agents are also on their own mission around the country, and they visit the church where Rivas created his wife's birth records. That is where they find the index that Rivas hadn't altered, which doesn't match the document that he did alter. They also find out that one of Rivas' attorneys had seen him trying to buy witnesses. And by this point, his attorneys, who are very upstanding uh, members of the legal profession, are starting to drop him very quickly because they do not want to get involved in this mess. Uh, and then when those Secret Service agents go on to question some of the witnesses that Rivas has bribed... He might have been willing to pay them a lot of money, but they aren't necessarily the brightest bulbs and their stories start to fall apart. I mean, sounds yeah, sounds like kind of a slam dunk for the feds at this point. So in 1895, it is time for Rivas's civil trial. Remember, this is Rivas, the plaintiff, suing the government. This is not his criminal trial, but it is the trial at which the government agents get to expose his crimes. So by the time his trial begins, all of Rivas's lawyers have dropped him as a client. He cannot find anyone to represent him. His influential friends have abandoned him. Uh, he can't even pay taxes on his own houses. He has lost most of the money that he received, either put it in real estate that he now has to give up, or he used it to bribe people, or he used it to pretend to be an aristocrat. On June 3rd, 1895, the Court of Private Land Claims begins to try the case of James Addison Peralta Rivas. But Rivas doesn't show up to try the claim that he made against the government. I, is he like ha halfway to Mexico already? 
he is frantically trying to find a lawyer and no one at first knows where he is. Uh, but some other claimants do show up, specifically a representative of 106 ex parte claimants who also happen to be named Peralta and are now claiming that they are the real descendants of Baron Peralta. The representative of all of those guys shows up because he thinks like maybe he can get in on this. Oh, my God. And the presiding judge is, I mean, the judge has an amazing time with this trial. He decides, even though Rivas isn't here, he is going to go ahead and let attorney Reynolds make his arguments anyway. And Reynolds gets a chance to whip out all of the evidence that he has collected that Baron Peralta never existed. Rivas made up the whole family story and the documents to prove it. As a matter of fact, uh, when the judge calls that attorney representing all of the other real but not royal Peraltas to the stand, that attorney has to admit that he also got hoodwinked by the Peralta story and believed it was real. And he wants the court to know that he his clients have no connection to Revis. They just coincidentally happen to be named Peralta. They didn't commit any fraud on purpose. Uh, that attorney immediately after he has his chance to get up on the stand. He leaves the courtroom. He takes a train out of town without even waiting for the trial to conclude. He's just done with this. I mean, fair enough. You know, you see a chance to get in on the action. I respect it, but you gotta know, you gotta know when the game's over. Yeah, he shot for the moon and boy, did he miss on that one. So Rivas keeps stalling. He sends a letter to the court trying to get a continuance so he can actually get himself a lawyer, but the court just keeps going uh, with the trial without the plaintiff present. And they have a grand old time ripping him apart. It's just, it seems like it was just like a great time for them to kind of let it all out until he finally does show up on June 10th. Rivas makes a valiant and very loud effort in court, but he is not a lawyer and his behavior does not impress the court, especially when he makes the decision to shout abuse at the priests who are brought in to testify about his shady behavior with the birth register. Not really a move that goes down so well in court. Yeah, that's a that's a rough sale. Reynolds absolutely destroys him. Rivas' one moment of hope is Carmelita, who cries under questioning and seems to be swaying the court in her favor. But uh, the court is not convinced, even when Rivas tries at the last minute to do the old whipping out of the paintings of Spanish nobles trick. And this time he puts a new spin on it, because he and Carmelita have very young twin boys, named after their fictional ancestors. So the boys are actually in court, and Rivas is comparing these two young children to portraits of old Spanish nobles saying, oh, aren't they just the very picture of their ancestors? They look just like them. You can tell in their bone structure. It's clearly it's clearly the same family. So this is his last ditch attempt. I mean, that's just desperate at that point. Like. That's that's not someone that's not a, a point that someone with a strong argument makes. Yeah, he's really trying everything. He's throwing everything at the wall and nothing is sticking. Um, on June 28th, the court rules that not only is Rivas's claim fraudulent, it is based on forged and manufactured evidence. So he has not been criminally convicted, but the court is saying, sure looks like this guy did a lot of crime. I mean, I assume the next step is an actual criminal charge. Yes, indeed. And it happens very fast, because as soon as he leaves the court building, a U.S. Marshal stops him with a warrant for his arrest. So he steps directly out of the civil trial in which his crimes are exposed and enters the criminal justice system, where he gets tried for all of those crimes that just got exposed. Specifically, however, he's not tried for every single crime that he committed. What he is being tried for at his criminal trial is filing a claim in the U.S. Court of Private Land Claims in 1893 that was fraudulent. So every all of the fraud that he did before he filed that claim, that's actually not going to be stuff that he has tried for. So what brings him down is the court system he thought was going to end his legal problems, and it is actually not a court system that even existed when he was doing the majority of his crimes. 
And it was when he advocated for the creation of, to be clear. Yes. Yes, indeed. It turns out that filing false claims for the purpose of defrauding the U.S. government is super duper illegal. Really? Because, I mean, I, I've, I think maybe, you know, given the last few years, I thought Thrawn was just okay. Yeah, take some legal advice from us. Don't do that. Yeah, th don't defraud the U.S. government, please. So Revis is staying in a city jail. He can't get any of the rich men who'd been his buddies to bail him out. His criminal trial begins on June 27th, 1896 in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And it actually seems for a bit like he's going to sway the jury in his criminal trial. Because here's the thing. Here is the thing about being tried by a jury of your peers. These folks in Santa Fe, New Mexico may actually be better peers than Rivas could have found anywhere else in the country, because most of them are like him of Spanish descent. And they are sympathetic to the idea of a Spanish guy getting what he deserves or maybe just getting one over on the government. Even though Rivas does get found guilty by this jury, they specifically recommend leniency. He gets only two years in the federal penitentiary and a fine of only $5,000 for filing this fraudulent claim. So Rivas gets no other punishment for his more than a decade of criminal activity, his scheme that defrauded people and corporations out of millions of dollars, all of that, no criminal punishment whatsoever. Yeah, he seems like a very legitimate above board man. When he's released after serving his sentence, he tries to make some quick bucks selling his story as a memoir, but he isn't really able to give people any information that didn't already come out in court. He tries to sell it again as a magazine, but doesn't really like publishing a magazine so much. In the end, he deserts Carmelita and his twin boys in Denver. He moves to Phoenix, and he actually becomes kind of a local curiosity and sometimes even a point of pride in the very town that he had attempted to steal. He died in 1914. He was deep in poverty. He actually was living on the support of the very government that he had tried to defraud, and I cannot think of a more fitting end for James Revis than that. I mean... You know, a man who dreamed big. I guess that's what you can say. So I wanted to talk a bit before we wrap up this episode. It was driving me a little bit nuts as I was doing research on the story. Uh, usually I start by trying to figure out whether any books have been written that have a really clear timeline of what happened. Uh, anything I can I can pick up that's been kind of recently published that might have the latest up to date research. Uh, the crazy thing is I couldn't really find a book about this guy published after after the 1970s. He was better known back in the 50s. Someone actually made a movie version of this story. But I was really shocked for the sheer scale and audacity of this con at how little he's known today. Uh, and I, that was just kind of driving me nuts. Um I was trying to figure out why that was. I have a couple of ideas, but I wanted I wanted to see if you had kind of any ideas of why he had fallen into such obscurity. I mean, there in terms of academia, I think it's that's a story that's a hard sell in modern academia. It doesn't really fit with the kind of stuff you usually get grants for these days, which swing more in the direction of like social history rather than kind of the biography of a specific person. Um in terms, I'm surprised there's not more popular scholarship on him, but I guess you need someone who already knows the story and w feels like they have an interesting angle to dive in and do all that research that they can then sell to a publisher. So I guess that that person just didn't happen along. Yeah, yeah, I, w I was wondering about that because, yeah, he's he's really interesting as a story but um true crime just sort of trends in true crime publishing tend to stay away from complicated land grant fraud cases so uh yeah if, if you are a pop historian and you want to write a book about this guy it seems like the market is wide open for you it doesn't seem like there's a lot of competition um the other thing i could i could think of was maybe it was because westerns had fallen out of fashion and there just aren't a lot of people adapting stories from this particular time and place. I mean, it's Arizona. 
I she I just know, really don't like Arizona. I've been once, and I can't say I ever want to go back. And my my final thought was that um, even though he did manage to defraud the rich and famous in spectacular fashion, his kind of the start of his fraud scheme and the core of it did involve defrauding a lot of very poor farmers with the quit claim deed fraud. That makes him kind of a hard guy to romanticize. Uh, we've talked about some, I mean, we've talked about so many con artists because I love con artists on this podcast. Um, guys like Doc Bags and um, Black Bart, some of those other folks who did have kind of a twisted moral code that they live by, they're easier to romanticize because they, I mean, they weren't stealing from the poor because the poor didn't have quite as much money. Um, but yeah, yeah. Reva, Rivas really did prey on some very poor and vul vulnerable people, which makes him a little bit hard to root for. Yeah, I mean, I feel like the angle, if you want to do something about him today, is the like the hardworking government agents who bring down this fraudster who's been like conning old widows out of the money he promised them. Yeah, maybe maybe something a little bit more centered on Carmelita as a character, because I mean, she I mean, that woman must have been one hell of an actor. It's all about method. <laughs> so, yep, that's that is the story of James Rivas. Um, I, I just thought, I mean, he really he really swung for the fences. And if it had not been for the very court that he advocated for, he might have had a chance of pulling this off. Well, thank you for that fascinating story. And if any of our listeners have any ideas for potential ways that we could defraud the U.S. government by stealing part of a southwestern state, where can they find us? You can find us at facingbackward.com. You can also find us on Tumblr at tumblr.com slash blog slash facing backward. We are also facing backward on Blue Sky. And you can find us on Patreon at patreon.com slash facing backward. Special thanks to all the patrons who make this show possible, including those of you who have donated at the shout-out tier. They are Yan Leonard, Stephen Elkins, Martin Oliveira, Clark Canning, Ian Kellett, Matt Haynes, Jackie Frostocker, Monkey Sack, Alayla McCulloch, Karen Murphy, Peter Wales, Robert Prine, William Arno, Jonas Brandis, Nicholas Kroll, Jerry Spinrad, Jared Stevens, Jeffrey Dwork, Stefan Hrushka, Joshua Kane, Robbie and Cat, Jacob Key, Aaron Finkbeiner, an anonymous Anna's hummingbird, Mark Sai, Gil, Leslie Ikuta, Trash Taste Enjoyer, Harrison Reese, Shimao Toshio's History of Yaponesia podcast, A House is a Perfectly Cromulent Mascot, The Fish I Catch Are Road Scholars Compared to Samuel Alito, Schmuck, and Everything Changed When the Fire Nation Attacked. Until next time, folks, uh, don't actually defraud the U.S. government. Please do not do that. But if you do, do it in style. <laughs>